Welcome everybody. Today we're going to continue the job of a London rating climb and compared to what we did in the previous video, I decided to add a little bit of a twist in a way that we're going to try to focus on three of the most important fundamental skills in chess. How to attack the enemy king, how to play positional and how to put pressure in the end game. Yeah, but that's because you're already a chess master that has no life. Huh. I didn't know accountants were so aggressive. Anyways, I got a pinky promise. If I will ever play a move that you feel like it's impossible to come up with or out of this world, I will let you say that uh, Alex Banzea sucks. Alex Banzea has uh, a small pee pee. He's not funny. He's a bad chess player. I will unfollow, unsubscribe. I will even uh, try to put him on the Kramnik list. But until then, let's dive right into the games. Alright everybody, uh, apparently we got ourselves a nice little 2100 rated opponent from uh, Australia. That's right, you bet. So we start knight f6, yeah, we're gonna try to jobava him knight c3, threatening to expand, most likely forcing him to play uh, d5. There we have it, which uh, you know it enables uh, our favorite opening. By now, hopefully. The Joe Mama London. Not the Joe Biden London. Hopefully you're not gonna play this uh, <laughs> in a bad way. Knight b5 here would be a kind of Joe Biden London kind of move. Just hoping for the fork and then if the fork doesn't uh, work, you fall asleep during the game. Uh, jokes aside though, in this very position, from a theoretical perspective, Knight b5... It's interesting, it's playable, uh, it's in fact the best move, <laughs> so to say, but uh, as a beginner, E3, you gotta learn to play this way. First, you need to know how to navigate these waters without relying on any cheap tricks, right? You need to have a solid uh, understanding of the bigger picture first. Um, and then go into the more like... Uh, detailed positions such as the ones arising after knight b5 over there. Uh, okay, bishop to d6. Um, important move order wise, always do bishop d3 first and then uh, knight f3. This has a lot of perks. Uh, hopefully, he's gonna take and then uh, we're gonna be getting our favorite pawn structure. At least, I don't know if our, at least I know it's mine. I don't know about you yet. If you feel like f4 pawn is weak, that's never the case can protect it with g3 and uh, yeah one nice thing besides this bishop d3 move that i want to really draw your attention towards is that uh it really helps us with the flexibility in case the opponent tries to go for a sneaky idea like let's say instead of castling he would have gone knight bd7 threatening to go c5 what do you think uh, would have been the best move over there the point is Normally, right, since c4 is uh, annoying, you want to be able to take. But then the issue is that our opponent would be able to take with a knight. Hitting the bishop, most likely eliminating it, and there's going to be no attack. Without the light squared bishop, um, this is just going to be an equal position. So, on a move like knight d7, it's really important that we started with the bishop, because we would be in time to play knight c to e2. So that on c5, we're in time to keep the bishop by going c3. Notice that on c4, simply duck the bishop on c2. Uh, okay, we're probably going to get something similar um, next, but I just wanted to let everybody know, move order really matters. Okay, move order gets overlooked the most and um, could really be one of the main things that... Um, Holds you back in these structures. And okay, my opponent plays 96. Not a great move. Uh, in order to equalize, black needs to exchange their uh, bad bishop, which could be done by uh, playing b6, bishop a6. And then the position is objectively equal, but it's still interesting uh, to play. With knight c6, basically, knight no longer supports that idea. Uh, this is going to be hardly a thing anymore, so we should be comfortably uh, better, I would say, already. Plus, it's also blocking his main idea to make Hanna play on the queen side with c5. Uh, yeah, I mean, he could try to play knight before, get rid of our bishop at least. Uh, it's possible, but still, it's not going to 
solve all the problems for uh, our opponent. And after we castle, let's see. I'm betting he will play uh, knight b4, but okay, a6, wow. Honestly, if this is a very 1200 elo opening that my opponent is playing, I expect these to see a lot in beginner games, so I don't really know what is going on. Uh, but it's important because this is one of the most vital positions, okay? You can try to pause the video and think about uh, what would you play. From my experience, people tend to rush by going knight e5, right? Okay, sure, I get it. We got good control over e5 square. But that allows knight takes on d4. Right. And knight from f3 won't uh, protect that pawn anymore when you play uh, e5. Would have thought, uh, you know, things that we do can have consequences. I know. I'm very clever for figuring that one out. You don't need to tell me. But knight e2 is going to solve that issue. Because we're preparing c3. Right? Queen d6 just hits uh, desert. Just a hit in the air. One is protected by the knight. Please go ahead, take it. <laughs> and, uh, okay. I would love to play knight g3 and then knight e5. But if I go knight g3, that's gonna uh, hang the pawn. So for that reason, I'm just gonna mix up the move order a little bit. I'm gonna do knight e5 first. And then, yeah, you pretty much get a dream position. You can see here our opponent, 2100 from Australia. Um... Yeah, it's going to have a difficult time to play this because uh, the bishop is uh, completely out of the game and uh, we're reaching our main attacking setup. He plays b5 because uh, taking would uh, allow a fork. So, uh, yeah, still could happen in 1000 ELO games, but not that much above that. Uh, so, on b5, I would say rook e1 is a nice move to play. Uh, also, f5 could be a nice idea to keep in mind in these positions that uh, you can use to undouble the pawn. But, uh, yeah, should I go for it? f5, it's very interesting because it's also uh, has its own positional uh, merits as well. Like taking and then if he takes to the pawn, he's going to have a backward pawn. If he takes uh, with the bishop, then okay. I mean, uh, we could be using the f5 square for the knight. Yeah, he goes on the side, most likely heading towards c4, which is an uh, interesting idea. I have to say the knight will be a little bit annoying over there. I could try to play queen e2, just saluting that idea. Or knight c4, maybe just go b3, kick him out. I don't want to go b4 because knight c4, then difficult to get rid of that. Knight h5, also another potentially very nice move. Takes, take with a queen, knight c4, let's say. I could take it with a bishop. I could also just play b3 in there, no? Yeah, maybe I just play b3 over there. Yeah, I think that's what we go for. Knight h5. It feels like the move that's the fastest. So, threatening to take, basically forcing him to capture. Unless, you know, if he tries to defend, that's not a thing, because then the bishop drops. Um, so he has pretty much to take, which brings my queen into the attack. The threat of doubling up his pawns, and then the queen is able to swing over. He's just too strong for him to ignore. So knight h5, one of the many moves, many plans that we have. Uh, and wow, he goes knight h7. Dude, you cannot live with a knight on h5 hanging uh, in front of your house like a kangaroo on acid. Dude, you're from Australia. You should know this. Uh, okay. Can I just go queen g4 and try to mate him? Who the hell is protecting that? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. He's inviting me. It looks like he just has to play g5, but that's... Yeah. That's just making matters even worse. I can at the very least take with a pawn. What is he gonna do in that position when I take with a pawn? Also, pause the video, why is g6 not solving the issue? That's a pretty important little idea. Uh, okay, he plays g5, the better defense. On g6, you have many ways to sacrifice on g6. Probably with the bishop is simplest, threatening to take with check, and then uh, queen g7, because uh, the knight is just really, 
the best uh, attacking piece there that we could uh, hope for. And okay, I have many simple wins like take the knight and then fork, pick up the bishop, that's a win. Uh, can I just play for mate? If he takes with the knight, I have f4. If he takes with the pawn, do I have bishop h7, queen g5, threatening to mate, only move rook g8, I have knight f6, check, king h8, and then yeah, I think this is easiest. I'm gonna go fg. I hope I'm not missing any defense, but yeah, this is pretty straightforward. Yeah, he takes with the knight, but at least that. Knight e7 as well. Uh, okay, which one do I go for? There is also like a h4 move. h4, f5 could be maybe a little bit annoying. If I start knight d7, does he still have f5? Yeah, maybe I just played like this, knight f6 check. I mean, it's honestly resignable territory normally. <laughs> but uh, you know me. I will probably find a way to mess this one up. Uh, so he doesn't resign. Can I just take... He really wants f5. Should I take it this way? Yeah, I think this is fine. And probably the easiest. And then h4. Uh, that's a rook we should be able to take on a good day, on a good day. Yeah, I mean, why not? I like my free rooks. Okay, he takes with a king. I mean, I have knight f6, I have h4. I think I'm probably just gonna do h4. Yeah, opening him up. f5, yeah, I know I was thinking to just go for it basically he he really wanted to go f5 i told you that was the main uh, thing we had to watch out for now i'm afraid it's a bit too late for him though could also play uh queen g3 i should just make a move and not uh tank on this one too much so take take he's gonna do knight e4 but then i have simple move maybe f3 okay gonna go for it Let's open him up. FBI open up. Uh, okay. He took. Expecting this move. I was looking to just uh, get rid of the knight. When that happens. Okay. Passive move I like. Meaning uh, we can maybe infiltrate uh, to the attack. Yeah. That seems reasonable. I should have actually used a few of these moves as an exercise. But... With only a minute left. I'm sorry, we have to go for it. Setting up a nice final trick. He cannot really take the knight because uh, of the discovery. And um, his queen is almost trapped. <laughs> That's pretty funny. His queen is actually genuinely trapped. I thought we were just playing for a mate, but turns out uh, we're also taking queens in the process. Hey, not too bad. I mean... Can you believe that my opponent is actually 2100? Can you believe that? Am I playing any moves that you feel like were impossible to find? Because I don't know, may may maybe I'm just delusional. Maybe this is some uh, 1000 IQ kind of game that only a genius could play. That would be a weird thing to say about yourself, but I don't know. I think everybody can play this opening successfully, uh, you know. Above 1,000 ELO, I would say that is the sweet spot. You're not going to get like this precision, but you can get to this point uh, like on a regular basis. And then with a few key ideas, dude, you're going to be killing, uh, you're going to be killing your opponent. So when it resigns, all right, everybody, uh, we are back with another white game and we're going to be attempting to play the Jubava London against a 1900 rated opponent. Uh, all right, so he has just played uh, the move e6, aka nonsense alert. Uh, we're gonna still play knight c3, hoping for the move d5, which is gonna be enabling the Jopava London. Now, he could also play knight f6, or he could also play c5. Those are gonna be the alternatives, but uh, finally, we see d5 on the board. Now, once you see d5 within the first, uh, let's say, two to three moves, that is going to be enabling the Jubawa London. And it's going to happen in the vast majority of your games, like 70-80% of the times, because uh, when you're playing the Jubawa London, you're threatening to expand in the center, kind of forcing black to play this move, not giving you a free roll. 
So uh, we're going to play the Jubava London. This is the starting position. And uh, okay. Uh, with this, you need to understand what is uh, the main uh, kind of concept behind it. Why do we do this? Why are we weird? Oh no, he has just played the move a6, meaning that we can never play knight b5, hoping for the fork anymore. Yeah, probably can just design this one now. Okay, forget about knight b5. Actually, uh, you don't really need knight b5 whatsoever. You can totally forget about that move. Uh, the strategy, you know, <laughs> there are many layers to the onion. So, you're playing the Jubava London, and I keep saying that word a lot. Uh, because you really want to give the enemy light squared bishop a nightmare. Okay, it either goes out on f5, and then whenever the bishop goes out on one of these squares, you go f3, g4, and pawn storm. Or he plays bishop inside the pawn chain, okay? Blocked bishop, we call this uh, also Michael Schofield, light square prisoner, never gets out. Uh, back already has a really bad piece. And uh, you have a very simple setup, so now... You can pretty much autopilot this. You can do e3, bishop d3 first, and only then knight f3. Okay, move order matters. This is going to be the optimal way of doing it. And castle. And then break with e4. That's how you always do it against the uh, light square prisoner. Goes bishop d6. Okay, very interesting. Remember what I, what I told you? Just autopilot, bishop d3. What happy if they take... Because um, that's going to take us to one of my favorite structures, uh, which I like to call the uh, Boa Constrictor. Because, uh, yeah, we're just going to go for a slow squeeze right now. Um, this is going to be more of like a possessional game. But trust me, this one is going to be really fun, really enjoyable. At the beginning, it may feel like the pawn on f4 is kind of weak. That's really not the case. Uh, because you can always easily defend it with g3 if needed. So knight c6 attacks the pawn, I'm just going to do knight f3. And why it's so important uh, and so advantageous to have this pawn on f4, this is pretty much uh, guaranteed that black is never really going to be able to uh, open up their bishop with e5. Because we have uh, two bad boys uh, stopping that. So now I'm just going to castle. Let him take on d3. That's a bit annoying, but really uh, not something we can do to avoid it. However... Uh, this is still uh, gonna be quite annoying for Black to play with the with the bishop. That's uh, gonna be passive. So goes uh, knight to f6, and now I have a very simple way to uh, get started. I normally just go knight e2, knight g3, c3, and knight e5. But if I do that business, I'm considering whether he can try to activate this bishop. So first, I'm gonna sidestep. I'm just trying to make sure that there's not going to be any nonsense happening onto uh, this diagonal. And then I'm going to do the maneuver. So you play c3, connect these pawns, knight to g3. Uh, and only then we're going to be playing knight e5. Rip camera. I don't know what is up with that. Uh, just give me a second. I need to uh, fix it. Oh, we're back. We're back. Okay. The universe doesn't want us to play the Jubava London, apparently it's too strong that my camera uh, almost stopped working for a second. That was some very strange uh, paranormal activity, but we're back. And okay, now C4, I'm just gonna move my queen somewhere. Um, Yeah, I, I can think a little bit of what could be the optimal square. Um, I know I want to play 95 in the future, it's just a matter of... Uh, considering uh, whether we play for f5 break or whether we want some knight h5 ideas. Because I could do queen c2 looking at f5 or I can do queen e2 with idea to play for knight e5 and then knight h5. Not clear. I think I'm just going to start this way and then maybe knight e5 rook e3 would be like the most um, uh, flexible way of doing it. And I still also have a very dangerous idea to play f5 right now. Because uh, I'm going to be able to take and get a knight on f5. To be honest, it would be, uh, you know, lovely if my queen was already on d2. Because after f5, the knight takes and then the queen lands on g5. But of course, uh, with the bishop on c8, uh, I didn't know for sure that this is going to happen. 
So I have to choose. Now, on b5, I can still push, take with a knight, g6. Feels a bit weakening to me. Do I want to start with queen d2? That allows knight e4, but generally I'm not afraid of knight e4. I don't think I will take, because that's kind of trying to open up this bishop, but I'll play queen e3. Hmm, this is really going to be annoying for him. It's a very uh, unpleasant structure for my opponent, and I think I'm going to go for it. Additionally, rook e3, double up, queen e2, some knight h5 ideas. Those are also very possible, and I think I'm going to go for it. I want to show a bit more, like, let's say, a subtle play. And rook e3 could also be effective in that view. But okay, he goes knight e4. Yeah, I think we do f3 now, just kick him out. So typical idea, do not take, but kick him out. And I would be really thrilled if he goes for uh, takes and then f6. Because then this is really like one of the main ways uh, for black of losing. This is one of the biggest patterns. Like we provoke this uh, f pawn move and then they have a backward pawn on e6 forever. And if they don't do it, well, we have a free roll. Also, now that uh, we took uh, with the h pawn, another additional idea is king f2 and then we can uh, take advantage of that file and play for the mate. And notice that it's a just a typical uh, dream scenario with strong knight against bad bishop. Like, the knight is uh, the most powerful piece on the board right now. I mean, such knight can even be stronger than the rook. And yeah, there we have it. f6, targeting my knight, as I said. Typical pattern. Uh, only square here, but good enough. And now we're just basically going to be pressuring uh, that pawn in the long run. Still, my opponent could be looking for e5 at any given moment, so I got to watch out for it. Like, for instance, king f2 now can be careless due to e5. If takes, there's going to be bishop g4. So, uh, yeah. I could think a bit to try to improve the knight. I don't see, like, really an uh, obvious square uh, just yet. Maybe king f2, e5. I have strong uh, intermezzo. I have rook h1. Yeah, targeting that h7 pawn. Maybe not so easy for my opponent to, to deal with that. So I think I'm going to go for it. E5 also, I don't have to take with the F pawn. I can just take with a D pawn. He should probably sack the pawn for activity. Otherwise, he's just going to get cooked slowly. Yeah, so rook A7, interesting move. Um, I think rook A1, like promised. Provoking some sort of uh, weakening. Let's say G6 move. And then, uh, you know, we just have to massage those weaknesses. If that's something you're into, I am. So I really like to soften my opponent's pawn structure. And then, uh, okay, ideally, we would love to get this pawn to g5 to start working on the dark squares. But the knight is in the way. I don't have a great uh, square for the knight. I think I'm just going to start with this. So normally as a rule of thumb, uh, you want to triple uh, your heavy pieces on the backward pawn which is e6 here. Yeah, okay, I can check, but checking doesn't have a have a follow-up. I can go king back to g1. Yeah, so I need to set up my pieces in a way that the g4 break uh, is going to happen. So I think this, preparing knight f2, and then preparing g4, and then maybe knight h3, g5. So that's part one of the plan. Okay, he goes h5, now creating further weaknesses. Already g4 is going to be way more efficient. I can already think of a plan to uh, evacuate the king so that I can uh, switch my rooks and then play g4. Okay, he, he does it himself. Nice. And uh, please feel free to pause the video. Now uh, you can really start massaging those dark squares. Key move to get the winning advantage, I think, strategically at least. Knight goes to g5. Terrible bishop. These are the key uh, weak squares. This is the key weakness to play for the backward pawn. This should be enough. But uh, also, I have two pawn breaks available. 
So I can try to uh, open up the queen side, but I will also be able to break uh, with g4 in the long run. So the plan is now to get uh, knight over g5. Yeah, that's a move. Um, I'm just going to play like queen f2, defend, then like knight g5. He's going to enter uh, fully passive mode or he will just uh, crack under pressure. Uh, yeah in the near future and uh, this game just makes me so happy that i pretty much uh, have so many of these uh you know what i'm actually gonna be uh, revealing something that i never said in the last two weeks so basically what i was doing is uh i was testing my uh upcoming jobava course uh offline so the plan is i i'm playing uh between 1000 elo to 2000 my plan is to play 1,000 rapid games to test uh, this craft. And I had positions like this regularly. And this really happens. Um, I'm like 700 rapid games in <laughs> to finish my experiment. But this is really one of the most common patterns in the Boa Snake. They just get a bad bishop, backward pawn, and just... Uh, Get the triple stack when e6. I had one game where, let's say, my opponent was able to uh, hold on to e6, like you wouldn't be able to win it immediately. But then still, you're able to finally break through with g4. Here, we're gonna be able to just, uh, yeah, cash in big. But, yeah, what is. There feels to be there is something wrong uh, with the knight, or maybe I just have a dirty computer screen. Yeah, that was it. Damn it. <laughs> All right. Knight for key. Yeah, honestly, you know, just try to put uh, put yourself in my opponent's shoes. I told you in the beginning, you play Jabava London, you don't care about that fork. You just care about making life uh, a nightmare for that bishop. If that's not a nightmare, I don't know what it is. Honestly, and please feel free to pause the video and just sprinkle the final touch. Oh man, this is so nice. It gets me so happy. I love doing this. Rookie sec, just... I mean, it's almost like I'm bribing these guys. But isn't, uh, you know, isn't bribe uh, just another way of uh, saying love? I think that's it. And my opponent resigned because bishop takes on e6. Rook takes on e6 was about to be a checkmate. So, uh, yeah, opponent just got cooked. White boys and grails. Back with another white game facing a 2,000 rated opponent from Slovenia. All right. Um, plays d5. Meaning that uh, he already enables the Jabava land. So I'm going to get starting position soon once the bishop lands on f4. And uh, okay, he can play uh, either... Uh, Active bishop or bad light square bishop? Uh, okay, f5 will get to pawn storm him. Uh, sorry, like this, I mean, the bishop always gets hit by the pawns whenever he tries to have it active or... Yeah, I mean, if he already locks it in, uh, we're most likely going to be getting a pretty uh, nice attacking structure against his king. So, um, yeah, he plays knight f6, going to do e3, bishop d3 first. Super important move order, okay, like... Most people remember the key ideas by watching the videos, but very often tend to neglect the move order, which could really be the main uh, root of your problems. So we're going to start with e3 and then bishop d3. And only then we're going to do knight f3. This could potentially be very important in the pinning lines. So uh, yeah, if black ever goes uh, bishop b4, which is like very common for uh, really any elo, if you do knight f3, yeah, you're not paying attention, then knight e4 becomes very annoying. So the difference is, if you do e3 and then bishop d3 first, like I suggested, on knight e4, not only that you can take the knight, but you can also uh, defend the c3 knight by playing knight g to e2. And that's going to be very easy to handle. So, bishop d6, going to be literally doing... Bishop d3 first and then knight f3. I'm happy if he takes on f4. Entering the uh, boa constrictor. Really, uh, my favorite structure. Gonna be uh, constricting him slowly. He castles and goes to f3. 
and uh, castling next pretty much uh, against uh, more or less any move. However, my opponent is trying to imply that the pawn on f4 is a little bit weak. That the f4 pawn is a little bit sus. Why are we playing this way? Well, the fact of the matter is that f4 is never really weak. And on queen d6, I recommend you just play this simple g3. Just protect it. Now, my opponent goes for an interesting move. He plays b6 where I think I'm gonna castle. But just so you know, especially in uh, lower elo games, the black players uh, tend to go uh, and double down on the idea. I think before, we can set up one of the nicest traps ever that genuinely works. If there's a trap that's that happens all the time, this is the one. You don't defend the b2 pawn by playing rook b1 or queen c1. That's ugly. But you instead go a3. Invite them to take on b2 because there's going to be knight a4. Genuinely trapping that queen. That happens all the time. Uh, so keep that in your back pocket. Plays b6 though. I'm going to castle. He could be prote preparing to play bishop a6. Uh, which is honestly one of the best uh, moves. He could also be playing c5. c5 is what I'm uh, more uh, annoyed by in this position, let's say. Because normally I want to be able to play knight e2 and then c3. But the issue was that uh, if I do knight e2 in this position, he has a uh, queen b4 check and then wins the pawn. But uh, yeah, he played the uh, bishop to b7 instead, which really allows our typical uh, dream setup. Knight d2, c3 happening next. If c5, c3, I want to be able to uh, yeah create a um, square for the bishop in case he wants to trap it. Yeah, that's not a problem. Notice how we can easily slide back. And uh, I think I'm just going to play knight e5. So the knight is basically untouchable. Because that's going to be a fork. If they take on d4, I'm going to be taking with a knight. Normally try to avoid getting an isolated pawn if possible. Even though, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Taking with a pawn can also be reasonable. But generally, uh, yeah, actually, in this very position, I have to take with a pawn. All right? Because if I take with a knight... Then he takes on e5 twice and wins a pawn. So if I want to do this move, I got to start by taking on d7 intermezzo. Okay, it's a question of how do I want to play it. I can take it this way. And then what is the plan? Okay, the plan would be to go g4, knight g3 afterwards. And then try some rook e1, maybe rook e3. With g5 and play for attack. Uh, can I go for that? <laughs> We're gonna go for the positional route. We're just gonna take and then uh, take on d4. Um, the aggressive route is fine, but if uh, possible, prefer the simpler play. And knight c5, uh, yeah, simple but very important decision. Uh, okay, you don't want to give him uh, the bishop easily. You want to really make him work for it. So I'm gonna keep bishop c2. Not e2. Because we really need the bishop onto this diagonal to make the king feel vulnerable. And okay, good decision by him. Uh, okay, like sure, after taking, he's going to have an uh, isolated pawn on d5. But the issue for my opponent in a lot of these variations was that uh, he doesn't get active counterplay. So this way, he will get some activity for his pieces, despite having a bit of a... A bit of a weak pawn. Now, my dream scenario would be to... I mean, trade queens, it's it's fine. It's maybe a bit much to call it a dream scenario. My dream scenario against the isolated pawn would actually be to get rid of uh, the minor pieces, yeah? Make like a magic spell. They disappear from the board and then put a rook on d4, put a rook on d3, get the triple stack going... And then uh, no matter, like, if he tries to defend, yeah, imagine he does the triple stack himself. Then you have a pawn break, you have pawn to c4. 
and then pretty much that just wins uh, the isolated pawn thanks to the uh, pin. However, yeah, it's we're not really living in a fairy tale, so that's not gonna be as easy to achieve. I could try queen f3, offering a queen trade, queen h5, offering a mate in one. Yeah, I think that's maybe a more clever way to do it, because after g6, queen e5, if we trade queens, at least let's get a tempo, you know, might as well uh, do it with a tempo. So, yeah, I'd like to get that tempo, activate the rooks. So, end games where uh, there are minor pieces only are kind of uh, defendable for black with accurate play, but still fairly unpleasant. So, he's not uh, off the hook immediately. Just uh, keep that in mind. Okay, gonna take, take. King of eight. I think now f3 is an important move. f4 is also fine, but I I think we prefer to have control over e4 square. However, whenever he does that, we can take and we're gonna be in a situation with strong knight against bad bishop. So I'm thinking more and more and f4 is pretty much to my liking. f3 it's more flexible, but now f4 has to be good here. Yeah, so he's gonna trade rooks, rook e8, yeah, all standard. I don't have a way to avoid this, but we're gonna bring the king and then we're gonna try to play for b4. And we'll just try to, okay, uh, slowly pressure our opponent and yeah, knight e4. I think this is a mistake, strategically speaking, because I can take. The only question is whether, is he gonna be in time to play f5? Because then, still, that's not like a dream scenario for him, but... No, this this has to be great for us. Oh man, I don't have a lot of time on the clock to play this accurately, but I think this should be good. I don't think I, I mean, I could do f5 to try to keep his pawns disconnected or g4 move. But I don't even have to. Like king e3, f5, I have knight c2, strong move. Okay, let's go for it. So f5, the main reason why I think we have a very good uh, chance to be better is that our king is going to be very active and... We're going to get the perfect uh, block here for a passed pawn, which is the knight. So yeah, he he delays that. Still, I can do king, knight, uh, c2, king, d4, knight, e3. Yeah, that's perfect formation. And he's going to have to support the pawn sooner or later, but then he will have to watch out for g4 break. So yeah, I think my opponent is really, yeah, probably already lost. I don't know, that's just my feeling, but uh, this is actually super instructive. So I'm glad we uh, we got to reach uh, this position because it's a very typical endgame. And yeah, now this is good because king f5, knight e3 is key move and he's unable to infiltrate as well. So we get uh, bonus points for that. Okay, so f5, knight goes to e3, now I'll have g4. Even if he tries to stop it, I don't think he'll be able to stop it forever. So yeah, maybe he's setting up... Uh g5 don't think i really care about it much i don't think i want to do h4 h5 because that's freezing everything i think we start pushing c4 or b4 one of those two i think maybe start with b4 because on a5 i can take and then infiltrate and the knight plays such a nice defensive role like closing all the entry squares for his king that's actually kind of insane so he has to play more or less waiting game right now. Okay, bishop c6. Yeah, maybe he's stopping a4, but not sure that matters. c4 interesting, perhaps going b5 and then c5 idea to break. The knight is like incredibly well placed because it's still like participating into the attack. It can always transfer to the queen side, but simultaneously stopping up, uh, stopping uh, any counterplay. Sorry guys, I'm just getting so excited about this endgame that uh, it's even hard to talk. It's even difficult to tackle the English, uh, the English language when I feel like this could potentially turn out to be so instructive. Uh, maybe he should go bishop a4. It's super committal, but what else? If you just give me b5, I get everything. So bishop a4, how do we play? It's actually a move that has no threat, so it's probably just super idiotic. And I can just play b5 and collect the bishop. Yeah, I mean, how can I even consider bishop a4? That's a stupidity. Okay, that has no threat. We don't care, and I think just b5, simple move. 
Then A4, C5. Uh, maybe I rushed. Not sure. I could have potentially rushed with that. Now, King D6, not a threat. So I can do C5 right away. Takes, takes, take with the king. I could also do A4 right away. I think both are the same. Two minutes left on the clock. He's slowly getting cooked. That's for sure. The king needs to babysit F5 and we're going to be able to get a passer on the queen side. So, because the knight uh, blocks all the entry squares. I think this should be uh, objectively winning. Man, this is like such an MVP knight. It's honestly insane. C5. He's trying uh, what he should try. For sure. Like he's uh, going uh, for h5. And then h4 and then h3. But it's so slow. In the meantime, we can literally trap the bishop. Holy. That's trapping the bishop. That's crazy. I'm gonna go for that. Look at this. So he tries... Like the cheeky king, I don't even uh, collect the pawn because that gives him king g4 and perhaps a better counterplay, but I'm threatening this. The bishop is going to be running out of moves. Honestly, this is pretty wild. Okay. See, this is why Nims of H pretty much a hundred years ago came up with his... Um, Theory that uh, the knight are the best blockading pieces. Here you see why that's a thing. Okay, can I just promote king c7, bishop e6, a5? He has no moves. Okay, I mean, the guy literally has no way to stop the queen. I mean, the knight covers everything. All the squares are dominated. All the critical squares are taken by the knight and the pawn is yeah just having the red carpet okay nice wow so b6 he has no way to stop b7 that should be a queen i'm sorry tb i'm not buying these we're just gonna get ourselves a new lady okay okay and the knight is so good it's even gonna assist the checkmate wait does it assist the checkmate or nah king g3 Check. Okay, I'll have to just bring my own king first. And then this is going to seal the deal. Okay, so I can take the bishop. Um, Yeah, let's take the bishop. Pick up the pawn. Come on, TB. The show doesn't must go on. <laughs> is that a word? I don't know, man. I feel like I'm just talking shit this whole game just because I got so excited that it's hard to focus, but that everybody is a checkmate. Oh boy. Honestly, I think this one may be the most instructive endgame that I, that I have ever played on the channel. <laughs> okay, the one from previous Jobava episode was interesting, but this one was just something else. Pretty crazy, everybody. And yeah, just for the for the end, we're going to pop in a game review. That's almost a 95% right there into the end game. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. To the following game? I think he meant to say to the following website. Uh, you can subscribe to this uh, newsletter to get notified whenever my uh, Jobava course will be ready. Thanks everybody for making it this far into the video and uh, I'll see you around the channel. Have a good one.